Thank you very much. Um, I didn't realize that was going to be planned, so that took one of my stories that I was going to tell you. But I'll still tell it anyway when we get going. I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for having me at Liberty University. This is quite an honor. I uh, didn't realize how big of an honor it was going to be until I got here. My wife and I got here yesterday and uh, took a windshield tour of your university, saw a lot of you walking to and from wherever you were going on campus. Very impressive. And I'm honored to be here uh, to talk to you today. And I want to say something about that, uh, the fact that you're here and the path that you're taking. One of the things that I talk about all the time is the opportunities that I've had in my life uh, that few people get to take part in. Working with President Reagan is one of those. And I'll relate some stories to you, that same story you just heard in just a minute. But I'd like to say that my life's path started kind of shaky and uh, trying to find my way back when I graduated from college uh, at the University of Southern California. I took a job as an accountant um, in Chicago. My wife and I were newly married and we moved there and I started working as an accountant for this big company. And I realized, I just, I'm not sure I really like this and that I'm going to do this the rest of my life. And then I had the opportunity to get in the Air Force. And it kind of blindsided me. It kind of came out of the blue, uh, the opportunity. But I took it. I accepted the challenge, and I went forward. And I got selected. I got selected to go fly airplanes in the Air Force. I got selected as a fighter pilot. And I did several other things, which I'll tell you about in a, in, in a bit. But the one thing that I want to impress upon you, students at Liberty University, is your path has already begun, and it's begun in the right way. You've had somebody in your background that has directed you uh, and helped you find your way to Liberty University. And you now have a head start on the rest of the people in this country just because you're here. And because you're going to learn good, you're going to learn right, from wrong, and you're going to learn it. You're going to learn it faith-based, and you're going to get a good education as to what it is to be an American. And what I th hope you get out of this segment of this program today, when we talk a lot about veterans, is what it means to be an American and the path that you take. And you have to follow the path that follows your heart. So, you know, I, I just mentored a young man in California here not long ago, as a matter of fact, my nephew, and his parents and his family and everybody want him to go a certain way. But he wants to go another way. He wants to be a firefighter. And I told him, I said, look, all these people that are telling you you should do this, you should do that, uh, that's all good advice. But in the final analysis, if you go their direction and it's not the direction that was in your heart, you're the one that has to live with that path that you took. Not them. They're done. And you're the one that has to live with it. So I commend you for being at Liberty University and following the right path. You're going to be good Americans. I'm confident of that. <clears throat> now, just to tell you a little bit, I'm going to give you a brief resume and tell you that uh, this is the path I took. Once I became an, uh, in the Air Force as a pilot, I became a fighter pilot. I was an aggressor pilot, which flew, uh, flew like our enemy against our own people. Um, I was a Thunderbird pilot. I flew with the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. I was a military aide to the President of the United States. I like that applause for the Thunderbirds. Did everybody watch the Super Bowl and see the Thunderbirds fly over the Super Bowl? And as a matter of fact, the Daytona 500 was opened by the Thunderbirds following the national anthem. And if you'll watch NASCAR this weekend at Las Vegas, the Thunderbirds are going to fly over the opening of that race. That's the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, which I had a part uh, in uh, putting together. I was a military aide to the president. I was a fighter squadron commander times two. I was an American Airlines captain. 
I was appointed by George W. Bush, President George W. Bush, to be the 38th member of the National Transportation Safety Board. And I worked for Airbus and was a vice president for Airbus Corporation for four years. A lot of those positions that I've had were positions that I would seek myself, make application to. Some of those were positions that somebody else would seek me. And if you do the right thing and you come out of here and you work hard and be a good American, people will come looking for you and help you on the path that you want to go on. So do the right thing, follow the right path, follow your heart on that path, and good things will happen. Now let me talk to you just a little bit about that path for me. Probably the highlight of my time, it's hard for me because the Thunderbirds was a big part of my life. Um, but military aid to the president was the most amazing. That was one that I didn't seek. I was doing a job after I left the Thunderbirds. I was in a staff position in the military. And I got a phone call one day, and they asked me, would you like to come interview for this job? And I said, what job's that? And they said, military aid to the president. And I said, what is that? And they said, we don't know, but uh, you fit the criteria. And if you want to go interview for it, you can. So I did, and I got the position. I did, went through all the interviews and talked to all the people at the White House. And uh, I got that position. So after I got the position, they said, move your family up here to Washington, and we'll get you all squared away, and you'll start training. And we'll start doing this. Uh, uh, your background investigation. Now, keep in mind, I already had a top secret clearance where I could look at compartmentalized information at a top secret level, but yet I had to have a security clearance that allowed me to see and hear anything that the President of the United States could see or hear. And so that was going to take about three months. The FBI was going to look into every aspect of my life, the CIA, the DIA, everybody was going to look at me. So we moved up. I started training. They took me down to certain levels uh, of security clearance. Uh, but then finally, my clearance came in. And they said, OK, your clearance came. You now have this Yankee white clearance, they called it. And you've got to go meet the president. Let's get started working. So I'll never forget the day I walked to the, they walked me down. I put my uniform on. I walked up to the door of the Oval Office. Secret Service agent opens the door. And there he stood. That's when I realized this is a really big deal. This is a big job. And it was huge. And from that time on, this man, President Ronald Reagan, and I got along great. We were both about six foot three. I was six three. He was six one and a half. He was from California. I was from California. He liked to ride horses. I liked to ride horses. And we rode horses together. And uh, I realized this is going to be a good time. But I'm just a military officer doing my thing and we became friends. And I want to tell you a couple of stories, one of which uh, they've already stolen my thunder, um, about President Reagan and my time with him. And I'm hoping, there's so many things I want to tell you here today, and I, they've given me only 30 minutes, and I can see I've got 21 minutes and 13 seconds to go. So I'm going to get, I'm going to keep going here. Um, one of the stories I'll tell you is just real quick about being on the Thunderbirds and what a proud time that was. In 1984, we flew, we uh, took the uh, Thunderbirds to uh, Europe, and it was the first European tour into Thunderbirds uh, in the F-16. And while over there, we flew uh, uh, 18 different air shows in 11 different countries, and we were about to finish, and we got a call from the State Department. And they said, uh, we would like you to fly one more air show before you come back to the United States. And uh, we would like you to fly for the King of Morocco. And this, is, uh, this was a big deal because we now had to get all the aerial reconnaissance pictures and so forth so we can map out the, the deal, uh, the show. <clears throat> and so we flew this show. There were a million people at this show on this riverbank. And we flew the show up and down the riverbank. The King of Morocco was somewhere in that audience. We couldn't figure where because they had several different dis disguised uh, kings around because of the assassination attempts. But he was in the audience. 
And it was the first time, and the, re and the reason I bring this up, it was the first time that the American flag flew next to the Moroccan flag. First time in history. And it was a great diplomatic effort on the State Department's part and the Thunderbirds, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be a part of that. I just wanted to tell you that quick story. Now, on to President Reagan. One of the things that uh, I ended up doing was being the guy that uh, worked most of, most of the um, summits with uh, General Secretary Gorbachev. Um, I did all the summits except Geneva. I did Reykjavik, I did Moscow, and I did Washington, D.C. And I worked together with the KGB and the Ninth Directorate of the KGB, which is their protective detail, in setting all this stuff up. But I would like to tell you a couple quick uh, instances of uh, how things went and what we did on those trips. Reykjavik, Iceland. We flew in uh, on Air Force One, and on the way in, um, President Reagan always on Air Force One. He would always come back from his State Department of, or State uh, compartment, and he'd come back and uh, tell stories and jokes and just talk. Very conversational, warm human being. And he would, uh, he told jokes all the time. Well, he told this one joke, and I'll tell you the joke here in just a little bit, but I'm trying to tell you what, uh, what kind of person Ronald Reagan is. And so we landed at Keflavik, Iceland, and we motorcade uh, 45 minutes to Reykjavik, I mean, uh, to Reykjavik. We get to the embassy, and we're gonna stay in the embassy uh, quarters there uh, where the ambassador lives. And so we walk in the embassy up the stairs, and we're up in the bedroom suites, small little place. And the president's standing there. The Navy military aide is there. He's going to catch. I'm going to hand off to him, and he's going to stay the night in the suites uh, room up there. And the personal aide. So there's only four of us up there, and the personal aide, he goes on into his room. And so uh, the president says, uh, well, fellas, I'm kind of tired. been a long day. He says, I think I'll turn in. Okay, good night, Mr. President. And uh, he goes in his room, the master's uh, bedroom of the suites that, that we're in. And so the Navy military aide and I are the only ones there, and I'm giving him a quick debrief, and he asked me, he says, Steve, did the uh, President tell any stories or jokes on the way in? I said, yeah, he told this one joke. And President Reagan's jokes were always apropos to the situation that he found himself in. We're going to see the Russians, so it's a joke about the Russians. So. He, uh, so I start, telling, I start telling this joke to uh, Pat, the Navy aide. I no sooner get the first sentence out of my mouth and the door to the master bedroom opens and it's the president standing there. He's already got his tie off and he's standing there and he's holding his tie and he says, Steve, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm telling that joke, uh, Mr. President, that you told on board Air Force One. He says, oh, let me tell it. <laughs> and so he comes back out and here's the joke. This is Ronald Reagan. He says, um, there's these uh, people in the square in uh, Moscow, and there's a, one of these big Soviet militia guys, the big state police guys in uniforms and got guns and all this, and uh, there's a guy over to the side over here named Ivan, and this state militia guy sees him. He says, hey, Ivan, Ivan. Ivan turns and sees the state militia guy, and he takes off running. And the state militia guy lowers his gun and he shoots Ivan. And all the people that are around there said, why'd you shoot Ivan? He wasn't doing anything. And the militia guy looks at his watch and he says, curfew, curfew. And everybody looks at their watch and they said, it's not curfew, it's still 15 minutes to curfew. The state militia guy says, well, I know Ivan, I know where he lives, he would have never made it. <laughs> Ronald Reagan. That was a, uh, an interesting summit, which has kind of a parallel of what just took place today. In that summit meeting, uh, President Reagan walked out on it, as, as what just happened with North Korea and President Trump. President Reagan walked out on it because of what General Secretary Gorbachev was demanding of the United States and of that president. And he says, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to give up our strategic arms uh, um, defense, uh, strategic missile defense system. And uh, so this meeting's over, and he left. 
That was an interesting time. President Reagan, uh, it upset him, but he said, we're not going to put the United States in that position. That's the kind of guy he was, and the kind of president he was. I was also with President Reagan at the Moscow summit. And this one has a little parallel here that I just like to say, uh, and it was a parallel that President Reagan really enjoyed uh, because he got a chance to speak to the students at Moscow University. And we didn't think they were going to allow him to do this, but he got to speak to this huge group. Uh, it was a group maybe this size. And uh, he spoke to these students, and he was so excited because he got to speak to these Moscow University students. But what a, and I sat there and listened to this speech, and you can go online, YouTube, and, and listen to the speech, but the thing that was so amazing about it was he was talking to people and trying to tell them what freedom is. Something we take for granted. We take freedom and liberty for granted. Uh, because that's the way we've grown up. We are free people. That's what our Constitution is about. That's what our Declaration of Independence was about. And yet, here you are talking to these students, trying to explain to them what freedom is and how we can, if you educate yourself, um, you can see what freedom is. That was a very telling moment for me to see President Reagan uh, speak that uh, time to the Moscow students. And it was a big thing for him, too, because he made a lot of, uh, he talked an awful lot about that after the fact. That really meant a lot to him to be able to talk to the students, he said, because that's where it is. He says, you have to uh, energize the next generation. Because one of his famous sayings was, freedom is only one generation away from extinction. And so that's why it's so important for the people that are sitting here, students of Liberty University, to realize that. There's a lot of veterans in here now, I understand. Uh, thank you for your service, by the way. But veterans of the military service in our country are what have helped protect those freedoms. They've sacrificed in many ways. I want to tell you about one that I just came across before I spoke here. Um, I just saw this a couple of weeks ago, and it hit me so hard, I said, I've got to share this with these students. This guy's name was Pula, P-O-O-L-A-W. He was an American Native Indian. He was a full-blooded Kiowa Indian. He fought in World War II. He fought in the Korean War. He fought in the Vietnam War. And, whoops. And he, um, uh, it epitomizes what sacrifice is. And the line that I want to share with you is uh, just before he died, he wrote a letter and he said, My job is more important than my life. And he ended up giving his life in Vietnam. Um, um, and you, if you read the full story, I won't share the full story with you, but you, it's incredible what he was doing in Vietnam after he's already been in three wars. This man won four bronze star, or silver stars, five bronze stars, three purple hearts. He won one purple heart in each conflict. He was wounded in each war that he fought in. That's sacrifice. That's an American, and I salute him. Another summit that I was with uh, President Reagan was the Washington, D.C. summit. Um, and I just got a couple of little things that, I don't know, if, are they showing some pictures? Scott said they were going to show some pictures, but uh, I've got one picture of uh, when the, the departure statements, yeah, there you go, right there. Uh, that's the Washington, D.C. summit. Um, it was the last day of the summit, and we're uh, walking through the mansion with the Gorbachevs and the Reagans, and the Reagans are showing the, the White House to the Gorbachevs. And we're just walking through, and I get, I've got a little Secret Service earpiece in my ear, and um, the Secret Service command post said, uh, tells me it's going to rain uh, as soon as you step out the door for this, on the South Lawn for the departure statements. The rain's in Georgetown right now, and it's moving this way. 
So I looked at the ushers and I said, uh, we need umbrellas and we need them right now. And so they got these umbrellas. Then they came back and they started saying, okay, who's going to hold the umbrellas for whom? And I said, well, I'm the military aide to the president, so I'm not holding it for anybody but the president. And uh, Mrs. Reagan, she heard all this going on. She said, I'll hold my own, um, own umbrella. So we had that taken care of. And um, so I'm going to hold it for the president, and the ushers are going to hold it for the Gorbachevs. Well, we get to this narrow little door of the diplomatic reception room to go out to the South Lawn, and the usher kind of sneaks in with President Reagan and goes out the door, kind of leaves me in the back in the lurch. And the next thing you know, it's me and the Gorbachevs and an umbrella. And so we pop out the door, and you, so you can see that picture. Of, that's me on the left-hand side. And I'm looking away because all the p staff members are down below looking at me, and they're trying to get me to dump water off that umbrella on the Gorbachev's head. <laughs> and, uh, but that was the Moscow summit. There were several other things going on that uh, I'm not going to have time to share with you, but uh, meaning, meaningful times for me. And I'm, uh, I've got to share the Berlin story with you that you heard there, um, just because it has, has such meaning to me and probably the highlight of my time with President Reagan. We were at the Venice Economic Summit, the G7, and after the G7, we went to Berlin, and uh, President Reagan was going to make two speeches. He was going to make one speech down at the Brandenburg Gate at the Berlin Wall, and then he was going to make another speech in the Tempelhof Airport Terminal Building uh, to do the um, uh, birthday celebration, 750th birthday of Berlin. So when we arrive uh, there, well, I got to back up. When we were doing the advance on this trip, they said well, one of the themes for the Berlin airlift uh, is the Berlin airlift pilots, and we want the president to meet some Berlin airlift pilots. And so I said, well, my dad was a Berlin airlift pilot. And they said, oh, that'd be great. How about bringing your dad? and mom to uh, Berlin and meet the president as part of him meeting people who were instrumental in the history of Berlin. So that's what we did. So when we arrived on Air Force One at Tempelhof in Berlin, we got in a motorcade and we went down to the Brandenburg Gate and the president made a speech where he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And so we were standing right there when he made that speech. After that speech, he got in uh, the motorcade back to Tempelhof, and he went inside uh, the, the Tempelhof uh, terminal to make a speech. On his way in, he met uh, three pilots from the Berlin airlift, one of which was my father. And he met some other people. He met uh, some people from the wall patrol, the Checkpoint Charlie guys. He met some of the Bundesfrau, which were the ladies that, uh, the women that cleaned up Berlin after all the bombing, brick by brick. They cleaned up Berlin, um, and he met several people that were instrumental in the history of Berlin. Following that, he went into a holding room uh, where my mother and father were, and so uh, President and Mrs. Reagan were there, and we all had pictures and time to talk and so forth. And then the president went on stage to make this speech about the 750th birthday celebration of Berlin. And in that speech, you heard what he said uh, about my father and about the fact that when the Berlin airlift started, my dad, mom, and an infant son went over to Berlin, or over to Wiesbaden, Germany, and my father flew for 11 months, 185 missions, into Berlin as part of the blockade and the Berlin airlift. And he also said that he's proud of the fact that uh, Colonel Chilander and my, uh, is here with that infant son, who's now my military aide. They're both with us here today. All that was in the speech, and he finished up that speech, and then we got back on Air Force One. I said goodbye to my parents, and we got on Air Force One. We flew over to Bonn, Germany, and uh, met with Chancellor Cole, <coughs> excuse me, for a couple hours. And then we got back on board Air Force One, and we flew back to Washington, D.C. We got into Andrews late at night, got off the, uh, the big airplane, got on Marine One, and we're flying back into the White House. And about halfway there, President Reagan reaches over and taps me on the knee and he says, Steve, he said, where are your parents tonight? 
And I said, well, they're still in Berlin, Mr. President, and they're coming home tomorrow on the C-5 that's bringing your helicopters back. And he says, well, he says, I was so impressed to meet your dad and what men like your dad meant to this country. And he starts into a, a bit of a discussion on uh, military, um, the airlift, the war, veterans. He was talking about the military and veterans and what they mean to our country. And he said, your dad signified what they are all about. And he says, I wish there was more I could do for your dad. And I said, Mr. President, what you just did was great. You met him and, you know, pictures and all that. And he says, well, I know. He said, but there's got to be more I can do for him. He said, when they come back tomorrow on the C-5, uh, do you think you could bring them by the White House and I could meet with them one more time? And I said, I think I can arrange that. And uh, so when we got there, we're just about to get in there, and he says, but there's got to be one more thing. He says, re he reaches in his coat pocket, pulls it out, and he said, these are the speech cards that I used to make that speech. And he said, I'm supposed to turn them into the National Archives, but I don't think they'll miss them. So he lays them down, and he signs his name on it, Ronald Reagan, and he hands me the speech cards. I was blown away. I, could, I was speechless at that. And I still have those speech cards. I have those speech cards with me here, as a matter of fact, because the Reagan Library tried to get them from me. And uh, I told them, no, you can't have them. You can take pictures, but I got to be there when you're taking pictures of them because I get them back and get to keep them. And I'm happy to show anybody that would like to do that uh, later on. But that was a huge honor for me, and that's who President Reagan was. He, was uh, he, he loved this country. He loved the military. He loved the veterans, and he was never afraid to show it. And he was a man of faith. He would have loved Liberty University. I know he would have, because he was a man of faith, and he loved uh, that aspect of life. And everything was morally good in his mind. I want to say a couple of things that I was very impressed with. I um, Let me see where I got that. One of the things I did before I came on was I, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, I looked up the, the mission of Liberty University, mission statement. And in that, I was very impressed with this. And I'm going to read it to you. Preparing students to be doctors, educators, ministers, lawyers, aviators, counselors, engineers, and more. Liberty is committed to developing tomorrow's leaders, men and women of character, whose impact will extend beyond their professions to change the world around them. Character. That's what you're getting here. I'm so happy that you've made it to this place. And I'm, I've already talked to my wife. We're going to start trying to push our grandkids to come to Liberty University. So I'm so impressed with this. <clears throat> and you, you have a head start, like I said. You, um, you have a head start against a whole lot of other people in this country. You read all the time about what's going on in universities all across the country and the liberal bias uh, and the way they're trying to uh, shut up the conservatives. And conservatives are nothing more than good people. Conservatives are nothing more than people that believe in uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. They believe in moral values. They believe in right and wrong. They believe in good and bad. And they uh, believe in the right on, a side, on that side and the good on that side. And they just want hard work. They want to be compensated for what they work for. They believe in a capitalist society. And uh, nothing more than that, just good people. And I believe you are the good people that are coming on behind. I'm 72 years old. I'm on my way out, as to, um, I'll quote Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby said, I'm so glad I'm on my way out and not on my way in to this life. You are on your way into it. You are the leaders of tomorrow. You, uh, I heard earlier people talking about impact. You will make an impact on this life, but I will implore you to educate yourself, learn about this country, learn about history, learn about why we are Americans, why we are an exceptional country. Learn about that, because the more you know about that, the better Americans you're going to be, the better leaders you're going to be going forward. I have 10 seconds left, and I'd like to thank you very much. 
God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you.